And there we go with the recording and the transcript. Okay, well, hello everyone and welcome to tonight's program, a discussion of Tollable David from 1921 with our special guest, Fritzi Kramer. Before we get started, my name is Andy Wolverton, and I'd like to thank Darnese Jasper, my partner in crime, for being my co-host tonight. Darnese and I are both librarians with the Anne Arundel County, Maryland Public Library System, which sponsors this program. And a special welcome to anyone joining us tonight for the first time. If you're new to the group and would like to be on our email list, please send me an email at awolverton at aacpl.net and Darnese has probably already beaten me to the punch <laughs> as she usually does. <laughs> that will keep you up to date on all the latest news for our movie events. Okay, uh, so before we get into tonight's discussion, I would like to say a big thank you to Martin and Nate at Flickr Alley, the company that holds the streaming and DVD Blu-ray rights to Tollable David. Martin and Nate graciously supplied us with a Vimeo link to the film, an option that's better than the one currently on Canopy. So thank you, gentlemen. And if anyone is not familiar with the work done by Flickr Alley, I would invite you to please check them out after tonight's discussion. Uh, they are at flickeralley.com. That's F-L-I-C-K-E-R-A-L-L-E-Y. And I just got an email today, one of those dangerous emails saying that Flickr Alley is having a sale right now. So just another temptation for you. Okay. Now, even before we watched The Last Laugh, a silent movie discussion from several months ago, I wanted to ask tonight's guest to join us for a movie discussion. Each time she posts something about silent film on Twitter, I always pay close attention because she is an incredible authority on silent film. Her website, Movies Silently, is the go-to online resource for anyone wanting to explore the marvelous world of silent cinema, whether they are silent film beginners, hardcore fans, or scholars. So I'm so delighted to have her join us. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome tonight's guest, Fritzi Kramer. Oh, thanks so much for having me. I'm excited. Well, we are excited to have you. Thank you so much. Well, Fritzi, I've just got a few things to ask you before we open it up for questions and comments from the audience. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself and how you got interested in silent film? Well, I'm from the VHS generation. And when my parents got a VCR, the first order of business were get it, was getting um, some movies, like, for example, um, some classic Hal Roach, some Republic serials, and classics like Arsenic and Old Lace and Bringing Up Baby and The Adventures of Robin Hood. So I've always been really steeped in classic films and I usually prefer seeing them over, over newer things. But um, when I was probably like 19 or thereabouts, I started noticing that I didn't know anything about movies before 1930. Like there was just this thing that cut off. And of course I'd seen pictures of like Valentino and Chaplin and things like that, but I was curious to see them in action. So I went to Blockbuster and I rented Sparrows, which is a 1926 Mary Pickford film. And I watched it and I hated it. Mm. <laughs> and what I've learned now, what I wish I had known then, but what I know now is that Sparrows is an excellent movie it's just that the tape was somewhat warped and faded and wasn't playing exactly right. So the organ score sounded weird and nothing turned out the way it, it should have been. But so I love it now. I don't want to turn anyone off sparrows. But so then I went back. I'm like, OK, get back on the horse. So I rented City Lights with Charlie Chaplin and that I absolutely loved. And then you know, being an Errol Flynn fan, I was also a Raphael Sabatini fan. So I saw there were a bunch of Sabatini adaptations from the silent era. So I watched The Seahawk and Scaramouche and I loved those. And I got into silent era DeMille. I, I started watching the Hal Roach comedies from the silent era and it was just the end. I was hooked from there. That's great. That's a, that's a wonderful journey that you made to, to, to go back and, and, and see that, that era. And, and I hope a lot more people do. Uh, my, my situation was kind of like that as well. 
Well, Fritzy, just to give you a little bit of background, we, we've seen a few films, silent films in this group, and I'm sure several people in the group have probably gone outside the group and seen more silent films. So you may be preaching to the choir somewhat, but can you talk a little bit about some of the challenges you face when introducing silent movies to modern audiences? Well, I think the number one challenge is that a lot of people have a notion of what silent films are like based on spoofs in pop culture. You know, they, they hear this honky-tonk piano and a mustachioed villain with a cape grabbing a maiden and tying her to the tracks. And so you have to get over that. And so that's, that's a huge problem because people are like, why would I want to see those? Those are ridiculous. And I actually had someone openly ask me, can you even take those seriously? So that's the first thing you have to overcome. And the second thing, I think um, they can be a bit exhausting to watch because I know the first few full silent features I saw gave me a headache because you have to concentrate so intensely on the screen and you're required to participate. You have to, you know, provide the sound information in your mind. And it's almost like reading a novel where you have to do a lot more work than you, you do when you're watching a sound film, in my opinion. So that's another challenge. And, but I think um, once people fall for them, they fall for them hard. So that's the good news. Once they're hooked, you have them for life. Do you find that a lot of people, uh, the entry point for a lot of people is either Chaplin, Keaton, uh, Harold Lloyd, uh, some of the comedic silent films? Oh, definitely, definitely, yeah. And slapstick particularly is the major entry point for silent film. And um, I think that's great, but I do think there's a tendency to be like, oh, I like comedy, but you know, the dramas are a little embarrassing. So I think that's another hurdle. You have people that maybe really enjoy watching the Keystone Cops, but to get them to see something that's a little heavier and a little more serious, um, they may not be as willing to try that out. So um, I think it's kind of a, a double-edged sword because it is a good entry point, but sometimes people stay there. We, we talk a lot, and before we did this, Fritzi, we had an in-person library uh, program where we would watch a movie together and then talk about it afterwards, which, which was a lot of fun um, as well. But one of the things that, that I find, and Darnese and I find a lot, um, not so much with this program, but in just talking to people in general, is it's important for, for us to put ourselves in the mindset of the, the people that saw these films for the first time at the time. Uh, what was the culture like? What was going on in America or wherever these films came from, Germany, uh, France, and try to put ourselves in the time uh, of what they would have expected in, from a film, the technology, that, that type of thing. Um, is, that, is that a bigger barrier for some people to, to get over? Well, I think it is to a certain extent because not everyone wants to do research before they watch a movie. And I mean, I'm not putting anyone down for that because, you know, sometimes you just want to relax and enjoy yourself. Um, and like, for example, I saw a Charlie Chase comedy called Mighty Like a Moose and a bunch of jokes in there depended on knowing the immediate current events of 1926 because they were very topical mm -hmm. and they're hilarious. But again, you know, it may not be everyone's cup of tea. Um, and I do think also, um, just like people make assumptions about silent films, sometimes there's assumptions about the culture of the time. Like I just did a big um, review of the 1896 May Irwin film, The Kiss, you know, the famous close-up of The Kiss. And mm -hmm. there's this assumption that everyone was clutching their pearls and shocked at the this blatant, you know, kissing in close-up on the screen. And I did the research, I dug in, and it turned out hardly anyone was offended at all. In fact, they were offended that it wasn't hot enough of a kiss. So, <laughs> so you, you kind of have to leave your assumptions at the door in many cases. Yeah. yeah. Oh, that's great. That's great. Well, uh, Tolable David turns 100 this year. And uh, I, to me, in, in so many ways, it seems really fresh. Uh, it, it does not seem like a film that is, should be 100 years old. Uh, it's it's such a wonderful film. It's and and as we were talking before we recorded, 
Uh, it's a very sweet film. It's a very intense film. It's got so much suspense. And uh, I can't wait to, to hear everybody's thoughts about it. But, but what do you think it is about this particular film that has stood the test of time? Well, like you said, it is sweet and the performances are excellent and there is an intensity to it that I think appeals to modern viewers. And of course, the most obvious reasons for its longevity is its coming of age story because everyone's had that moment where they're told they're too young for something. But I think I, as I was rewatching it for this, it struck me um, one of the biggest things about it that makes it sort of universally understandable is that this experience of, you know, everything's going fine and then someone just throws a rock and just completely destroys, you know, any peace, any happiness that was going on. Because, I mean, I think most of us experienced that to some extent in 2020 and the audience of 1921 would have just come out of World War I and the influenza epidemic. And so I think it would have hit them on that level as well, where things were kind of peaceful and bucolic and then smash. You know, even if they hadn't been perfect before, they were still better than, you know, no man's land and flu wards filling up. So I think that's a major part of its continued appeal. Well, Fritzi, would you like to tell us a little bit more about the film, uh, maybe some background information and some of the cast and crew before we open it up for questions and comments? Sure. So um, the two leads of the film are Richard Barthelmus and Gladys Hewlett. And Barthelmus had established himself, um, his mother had been a personal friend of Ala Nazimova and she had been the one who had said, hey, maybe this kid's got something for the screen. And he had been kicking around in, in supporting roles and he had played Hewlett's leading man a few years earlier. Um, but he hit it big with Broken Blossoms and Way Down East. And then he really fell in love with the idea of making Tollable David, which um, the rights were owned by D.W. Griffith at the time. And through some negotiating when Griffith opted not to make it, uh, Henry King and, um, and Barthelmus decided that they would form, um, form inspiration pictures with Charles Duell. And so they got the production going. And Henry King, the director, actually grew up not far from where Tollable David was filmed. It's set in West Virginia, but filmed in Virginia. And um, so when they were adapting the film, the screenwriter, um, Edmund Golding, was an Englishman. And um, King felt that he just hadn't gotten the right flavor, the right um, rural American flavor for the film. So he just went and reworked it. And um, the author of the original story, Tollable David Joseph Hergesheimer, said that he felt he improved the story because the original book, uh, the original short story, Tollable David, is um, it's very direct and to the point. The only female character is David's mother. Esther was an invention for the screen. And the... Um, and the villains are kind of treated as a group. They aren't given much individuality. I don't think they're even given individual first names in the original story. And so basically it's, um, it's more, of a, um, more of a idea of Goliath than a kind of a literal Goliath, um, although it is directly referenced in the original story. Um, so there's a lot of work done to make the, the film sweeter and more um, uh, more family oriented. And so King felt that was very important to kind of bring about that, that flavor of the childhood he had experienced. And I think that shows on the screen. And uh, Tollable David was met with absolutely rapturous reception. It was named best film of the year um, on many lists. And um, it basically established uh, Barthelmus as a leading man, and he was able to leverage that into a, a career where he made some pretty interesting social films as well. And it established Henry King as a major director. Unfortunately, Gladys Hewlett's career didn't last lo much longer after it, but she had been in movies since the 1900s as a child star. And um, she just for whatever reason, it wasn't able to turn that into as long a career as she should have had, but she's every bit Barthelmus is equal on the screen and just excellent in the role. And of course, Ernest Torrance, who plays Luke, is, 
continued his long career as a character actor. And he's absolutely wonderful. He was apparently an absolutely lovely man, a classically trained musician. And, um, but he scares living daylights out of everyone. I'm <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Really so, um, so yeah, it's, um, and then it kind of had an interesting afterlife because it was used as the film being shown during the Tingler scene. When the Tingler is crawling across the scene, they're showing the very finale of Tollable David. And I would have been angry about the Tingler <laughs> interrupting that scene um, because when the film was shown, um, I, I was able to see it live at the San Francisco silent film Day of Silence in 2017. And during that climactic fight scene, you could have heard a pin drop, like there was absolute silence. And I'm pretty sure a lot of people in the audience had already seen it, but no matter how many times you've seen it, you always take a little breath at the end when you see the cabin door and it's about to open and you're not sure who's won the fight. So, I mean, if that's not a recommendation, I don't know what is. <laughs> Well, thank and and you know that we that brings up something we were talking about before is the um, first of all this fight seems like a real fight. I mean, it seems like Bartholomew is really getting slammed against the walls and the door. Um, it, it really is quite brutal. Um, and and we were just talking about how audiences reacted to things at that time. Um, and and I you probably know I I don't know how how rough that was for the for the people i mean there were no stunt people right no stunt men um whenever they say there's no stunt men i always assume there were okay. um i hate I, um i i know um because i think uh one stuntman said only buster keaton was the one he knew who was never ever doubled yeah. everyone else you can pretty much assume was at some point but they absolutely did do a lot of the fighting and um, I think we were talking earlier, too, about how um, the scene would have been shocking at the time, but it would not have been out of the norm because uh, this was before Will Hayes came to Hollywood. And there were some very violent fight scenes if you were to watch um, gangster films, like, for example, in two films from 1915, Alias Jimmy Valentine and Regeneration, which was directed by Raoul Walsh, um, both feature some pretty gory uh, fight scenes and uh so Paulable David um like I said there's a lot of suspense involved in it but it wouldn't have been considered shockingly violent compared to other content that was shown at the time yeah really interesting yeah just a tremendous tremendous scene and and the editing I mean we a lot of people talk about modern films and how well they're edited but this film is superbly edited uh, especially the suspense where uh, the fight is going on and then we see the scene of David's mother just kind of casually just you know waiting and you know where's the where's the where's the mail truck or where's the mail carriage uh, the editing I thought was wonderful in this yeah and and that and that echoed the earlier scene where um, Alan the older brother is being uh, attacked um, mm -hmm. and and David is just, you know, sitting around imagining himself driving the mail coach. And meanwhile, his brother is being attacked on the mail coach. So there's a lot of like um, ju juxtaposition that creates dramatic irony. It's really, um, it, um, it, it, you're right, it, it's really well edited. Well, um, Fritzi, unless you have some, some other things about the, the film to tell us, um, certainly welcome that but um if not we can open it up to questions and comments did did you have anything else you wanted to mention about the film before we uh before we go to the audience um let's go ahead um i think i've i've covered everything so well not everything but yeah. my, my thoughts <laughs> <laughs> okay darnies uh we'll see what uh what we have so again you can raise your real hand or your virtual hand or use the chat so um i'm guessing is that gene um, in the in the chat, uh, spoke about the audience of the day and how they would feel about Rose breastfeeding. Was it a big deal? Was it not a big deal? Um, that was one of the questions that we that I had as well. Yeah, you know, it's a question I've had as well, and I have not found another scene of such open breastfeeding. Um, 
but with that was the caveat that most silent films are lost but it it that did strike me as very unusual but when i've been researching i couldn't yeah, find right. any complaints about it so mm -hmm. that leads me with the assumption that maybe it was not that unusual or maybe people were so caught up in the drama that they didn't really notice, but it is like a full medium shot of her just rocking, staring ahead, nursing that baby. So I don't know that they could have missed it. So yeah, I agree with you. That's, that's something that I've been interested in um, because you don't find many open portrayals of breastfeeding or pregnancy to that degree. Most of the nursing is like bottle or rag that you see in the films. Yeah. Exactly. Or, and a real baby. You usually yeah. just, yeah, that was really interesting. Um, so I caught a few hands while I was reading the um, chat. So I saw um, Jim and Ethan. Was there someone else? Um, and Chuck. Okay. So go ahead, Jim. Okay. Yeah, I, uh, when I first started watching this film, a couple minutes into it, when Esther first made her appearance, Excuse I me. said, oh, this is going to be a really sappy film. I'm not going to enjoy it but I really liked the film. So I'm really glad I stayed through it. Nice. Same. Um, Ethan? Um, in one of my classes that I'm taking now, we are reading a textbook and the chapter that we're going over right now is all about different camera angles. And I just read the chapter of the close up and it said something like cinema was completely changed when the close-up was introduced into movies and watching Tolliver David and all the close-ups, I could tell that it was sort of sort of in its infancy, at least compared to now, 100 years later, but it was very, very, very effective and impressive, all the close-ups. I could really, I could really, really feel all of the reactions of every character, specifically, David, his, the, the lead's performance was without a doubt my favorite part of the movie. It was very, very impressive and also very, very modern. It, it almost felt like I was watching a movie that was made now, trying to look like it was made in 1920 because that acting was so modern. It felt like what acting is now, very prevalent. And I really admired, I really admired that. Good point, Ethan. Yeah. Chuck? And then we got Jim Matthew, too. Yeah, I had a question uh, for Fritzy if she had any information on where the movie was shot. Um, because I thought one of the great things they, that they did in the movie, they put you in that element um, with the rural town area. I really felt like that was taking place in a real rural town. So I don't know if you had any information on that. Yeah, let me. Um... Let me look at my um, my notes because um, it is they did say where it was filmed, but I, I'm terrible with geography, so um, um, I just remember it was in Virginia um, near Henry King's birthplace, which um, yeah. So um, let me um, let me dig through my notes and I'll get back to you on that. Sorry about that. No problem. Thanks. Um, I got you, Bob. Bob. Susan's next. Um, she was, do you want to put your clothes on? There you go. Um, hi, guys. Um, one of the things that I really um, noticed about this movie, because I'm sort of an animal lover, is that there were so many animals in this movie, and they were all like normal animals. You know what I'm saying? It's like, it wasn't like they were the only the only acting animal in that whole movie was the dog and i knew that the dog was going to get killed but when i watched that scene i was watching the dog because i watch dogs and he he actually jumped up if if you catch the cut he <laughs> he, he he didn't hold his dead dog pose so it made me feel a little bit better about but the dog was terrific. I mean, he when he took the pants and ran off with them, it was great. <laughs> Silent era animal <laughs> actors were the best. They really were. That's so funny. Um, okay, we've got uh, Matthew next. And I got you, Bill, too. 
Uh, so I really enjoyed Ernest Torrance in this and most things. And I got to see Captain Salvation for the first time this week, and he was so good in that. And I guess question for Fritzy or Andy or Ernest, has there been a, a really good biography written about Ernest Torrance that you could recommend? You know, I'm not aware of one, um, but um, there could be some notes um, somewhere where he's um, – he shared his memories, but you know that's that's something that definitely deserves to be covered because he was really one of the wonderful actors of the era, the character actors of the era. Oh, and I I looked up and um, it was filmed on location near Henry King's home of Christiansburg, Virginia. So that's the that's the location of Tolerable David. Thank you. Okay, so we've got uh, Bob and then Bill. Uh, this this movie had me before it even started with the uh, opening music. I, I I thought this is some classical music that I've not heard before. <clears throat> and then the cinematography, that opening six ridges of the mountains that uh, are the opening uh, explanatory uh, credits. Uh, I feel uh, exactly the way that uh, Ethan did, uh, that this was a movie that was filmed yesterday, made to look like it was filmed 100 years ago. The, uh, the, the cinematography is the equal to anything I've ever seen uh, from that era and far superior to most, most of the other great flicks of, uh, of that time, The Kid, The Sheik, um, they came out, I think, the same year. This this just dwarfs them, and uh, I the the only question that uh, this is esoteric of squared, I think, but the uh, town leader was a guy named John Galt, who was of course the hero of uh, Ayn Rand's uh, Atlas Shrugged. She was in Hollywood at that time, and I wonder if she might not have been influenced by. Uh, her naming of her uh, 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 hero uh, by having known about the uh, making of uh, this movie. Anyway, I, this was a, 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 one of the best silent movies I have ever seen, and I just was thoroughly enthralled by it. Thank you for having it. I'm glad to hear that. You're never quite sure with Bob which way he's going to go with the movie. So. <laughs> That's awesome. Thanks, Bob. <laughs> um, so we got Bill S. Bill, Bill Snyder, yes. I enjoyed the movie a lot too, but I, I, I'm on. I don't. I don't fully understand the name. So I assume tolerable is a, a contraction for tolerable, mm -hmm. and and I don't get it unless that word had a different meaning a hundred years ago. I mean, just because he's young, that sounding saying he's tolerable is like. Uh, I can live with you, but I'm not really happy with you. <laughs> just that name, just, that word didn't make sense to me. And they said it in the movie, but I still don't get it. Am I missing something here? Oh, you know, was it? Oh, sorry, sorry. No, no, no. Go ahead. I okay. was wondering that too. Oh, it was. Um, it was a. Um, it was in the original short story as well. Um, well, I mean, of course, because it, it was entitled "Tollable David," and I always read it to be kind of a, um, like a playful. Um, sort of nickname within the family you know you're, you're tolerable you know you're just tolerable and so that's that's how I always read it as not necessarily to be taken literally just kind of a a way to um you know say you're doing okay kid right um yeah I was gonna say I grew up in the south and that that word was used a lot when somebody would say how you doing and frequently somebody would say tolerable <laughs> like I'm doing okay not great. And I, that's Not how terrible. I took it too. Yeah, I, yeah, I took yeah. it like he's just he, he's he's just the, the guy. He's he's okay. He's doing yeah, his job. Yeah, he's okay. You know? He's a he's a person in the family. You, I, I honestly the way that they were talking about it is kind of weird. The way I, I think about things, but at the end of Babe, the movie, when the Hoggett says, you know, that'll do, pig, that'll do. That that mm -hmm. the way that they treated him was sort of that like you did good. Yeah, just just keep it over there. Um, so, so that was interesting. Um, we've got Wally next. Can you hear me? 
Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Um. So I, I just thought about it. I can't. Um. I can't remember ever sitting down to watch a silent movie, um, from beginning to the end. Um. I don't know why I just felt um, it was okay to just know, oh, there's some very important silent movies out there. You know the plot, you know the iconic scenes, and then you move on with your life. That's one. Two, I hate reading. I'm a, I'm a picture and sounds person. So I hate the idea that I have to keep my eyes glued to the scene, to every single scene to understand what's going on, you know. But this was an awesome experience, you know, like um, it was much better than I, ex it was much better than I gave uh, any silent movie permission to be, you know. Um, two, uh, two scenes actually, moved me emotionally, like got me really, really emotional. And both scenes involved David and his mom. The first time was when his mom uh, chased after him and um, held his feet so that he wouldn't run off to get killed. That scene was so powerful to me. I was, you know, I, um, I've seen that kind of scene many times you know so nothing i mean nothing in this movie is new today like it's been redone it's, it's inspired so many um it's inspired so many um um movies you know so we've seen all those themes done in more recent films over and over again so nothing nothing particularly is new to somebody who has been watching movies for for years but it still had the impact you know i was still moved um i still had to fight back tears at that scene and when he got back again from you know from all the fighting and his mom had to get him um from the carriage we well, basically he came back a hero you know after like sacrificing himself and almost not so that's um, that scene was also very powerful to me because of um, the importance of his relation to his mom. You know, I um, I was almost sure he would um, leave his mom there and go fight those guys. I was, because that's what I'm used to seeing. But her making that plea that, oh, if you die, um, how are we gonna cope? You know, th just the thought of horror that they will go through if he also died. I think that also helped move me. Um, yeah, so yeah, this was a really, really good film and I understand why um, it was preserved and remade and inspired so many movies. Thanks. Great. Thank you. Hi, uh, Susan, well, let's we'll see. Susan and Jim um, both uh, had a comment for Will Up Brew which go. And then we'll go back to Susan and Jim. And Bill, is it prison here? Okay. Go ahead, Bruce. Yeah, I'm sorry. I got lost in the, in the yeah, show. Yeah, sorry. I said a lot of words. <laughs> I, um, I, I I know I, I'm kind of harsh on movies, but I really, really like this one. Um, I, I A few things I noticed. Well, one thing that I do appreciate about the silent movies is because there isn't that dialogue. You have to get that story um, through, you have to get the emotion through with the acting, with the lighting, with the stage setups, with the props. I mean, it, everything has to contribute to that story. And I thought um, there was a lot of that that I thought was very good. The, the, that evil hunch that the bad guys would do or someone would do before they would attack, they would have that, that hunched over posture. So almost like a dog with hackles up. I thought that was, that was very well done. Um, there were a, a couple things that I thought were very, very powerful as well. Um, right before they're leaving, uh, when they pack up the house and they're moving out, when, uh, David has the, um, the, uh, uh, 
the little verbal altercation with Esther and he really gives her what for and says, you know, I, I know it's not your fault, but I'm still mad at you. I hate you. I can't stand you, whatever. He gets back in, it gets in the cart and he says to his mom, we haven't left anything. And I thought that statement, it could have been written, it could have been written, we got everything or what have you know, there's nothing left in the house. But that's not what he said. He said, we haven't left anything. So every single tie they have to that location has been severed, including that tie with Esther, which I thought was, was pretty, pretty powerful. Um, quick little thing I noticed, uh, the bad guys were named Hatburn and David's last name, that family was Kinnaman. And I was wondering if that was somehow related to Hatfield and McCoy. Um, it seemed far enough apart to be a subtle reference, but close enough to be a reference nonetheless. I don't know if there was any um, uh, uh, thoughts with that research-wise, but where this was taking place, it could have stood to, to have those two families involved. And, and I would like to, to hear everybody's thoughts toward the end, uh, and, and Andy can cer certainly do a great job moderating this. I'm curious about the last scene. We don't know if David lives or dies from the fight. Mm -hmm. um, he also sort of gets what he wanted uh, it, this, in terms of a rite of passage. He got accepted as a man, and they even said that. And he said, no, Ma was right. I'm just tolerable. And I'm curious to hear what people thought, what he meant by that. Was he saying that, was he diminishing his own win in the fight? Um, is he saying that he did what anybody else would have done? He's not special. He just, you know, any man would have done that responsibility of bringing in the mail or what have you. Um, I'm, I'm just curious to hear thoughts on that. Bruce, that's a great, great question. Uh, why don't we have a few people respond to that? And then Fritzy, you can... Uh... You can join in after a few people have, have given well, their opinion. Before we get to that, I just want to give um, Susan and Jim a chance to say what they were going to say um, in case it been built, just in case it oh, was sure. not um, related. And then we can certainly open that, that discussion okay. up. Susan? Are you there? Susan, okay. maybe we can come back to Susan. We'll come back to get Jim. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Um, something I noticed on this that I have never seen in another silent film before, but Fritzi has seen tons more than me and she may have done it anyway, was each time they had a new character on there, they'd give the character's name and then they'd have on there who played that character. So I thought that was an interesting device. Yeah, that was, um, I don't know if that was common. That was, that was very common. Uh, to have an introduction. In fact, in some earlier films, they would introduce the actor as the actor in evening dress and then have them with a dissolve morph into their character as like a formal introduction of them. It's very charming. Like that. Um, okay, Susan, I saw you got your- Sorry about that. I, uh, yeah, no problem. Hear me? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Um, I just wanted to kind of expand a little bit on what Whale said about the fact that this movie appears to have been the origin of a lot of film traditions that have happened since then. Um, the, the, the evil uh, trio, um, it, it just, there's been a lot of films since then that have sort of copied that. Um, the Young Man in Peril. Um, <clears throat> I just, I, I really think that this, the, the, and one of the reasons why this film is considered a classic is that it is a lot of what it was in it was totally new. And that a lot of film since then has taken those themes and expanded on them. Very true. Thank you. Excellent. Excellent point. All right. Um, Bill B. Yeah, a lot of really good uh, points and uh, uh, interesting comments by, by people tonight. 
Uh, and I, I agree with an awful lot of, of, of uh, went on before me. Bruce kind of beat me to the punch on the, on the Hatfield reference because I noticed that as well. And it's close enough to the Hatfield-McCoy thing. I wonder if there was a veiled reference there. Um, uh, I was uh, particularly struck, I think, by the strength of the visual storytelling uh, that uh, people have already talked about, the cross-cutting in it, uh, the close-ups, and uh, the editing seemed to be more of a piece and more consistent than I think an awful lot of films of that time. Um, I think uh, uh, in terms of the visual storytelling, uh, I uh, think it comes very close, so not quite to the level of Griffith's best work, uh, uh, Broken Blossoms, uh, uh, um, Orphans of the Storm, uh, Intolerance, uh, Birth of a Nation, in terms of that visual storytelling, but very, very strong. Um, I think uh, uh, Bruce brings up a really good question about uh, uh, David's um, admonition about, oh, I'm just hollable. And I had sort of the same things running through my mind in that I was sort of struck by the idea that uh, he was a boy who became a man as a result of the events that took him to the end of the picture. And I think part of the revelation of what it is to become a man was uh, to know it's, hey, it's not all just uh, um, being a man and, and, and having all of the, um, the accolades and the respect and everything that goes along with being a man. It, it also entails all of that responsibility, the heavy responsibility of reaching adulthood and trying to wrestle with all of these things that a man would have to contend with. And in so doing, it sort of reflects back on his own inadequacies and in humanity. And it's like, hey, you know, I'm, I am just, just a person, I'm just a guy. And, and uh, even if I've done something heroic here, uh, I've been on this journey and uh, it's, it's all part of becoming a man. But I, I agree with Bruce that there's a number of different ways that you might want to interpret that scene. And I thought it was also uh, very interesting and telling about not letting us know whether or not this was a happy ending or not, because we don't know whether he survives. It, it ends just at that point. Uh, and I guess the, um, uh, the, the last uh, uh, comment I would make would, would be, I had to continue to remind myself, but it's uh, the historical context of this film in terms of there were so many plot points that if you just looked at it and didn't think about it, or the fact that this was made in 1921, that uh, there were all of these sort of cliched part of the plot points, including the holding the legs of David by his mother. I mean, I've seen that in four or five other films, but this was maybe the first film that did that. And it sort of created those cliches, which is a lot of the way I look at John Ford's stagecoach. There's so many Western cliches that if you're not looking at it in historical perspective, you can't, you have to say, hey, no, that was the, the movie that kind of invented that. Uh, so uh, I, in closing, I'd like to say, uh, um, uh, I was really glad that we saw such a good print of it and I read a little bit about the fact that they took, I think, major parts of a couple of different uh, uh, negatives to create this. And I'd be interested if our uh, uh, a special guest had any more knowledge about how the film was restored and put together and uh, anything she can add to that. Oh, well. Yeah, yeah. Fritzy, go ahead. <laughs> Oh, sorry. I forgot I was unmuted. Um, <laughs> so um, I don't know too much about this particular restoration, but um, I, um, I correspond pretty regularly with um, Christopher Bird, who is a director and film editor in England. And he did that with The Cat and the Canary. And uh, I love that movie. So we discussed it rather intensely. And basically, it's this labor intensive process where you have to compare each scene and a lot of times the prints um 
the prints were actually taken at a slightly different angle because they would use the very best angle for the American release version. And then they'd have other cameras on the other side, you know, a couple, maybe one or two cameras shooting negatives to create the European cut. Um, and those angles will be ever so slightly different. And so when you're putting together a movie, depending on where your print is from, you have to make sure that your shots match. And sometimes they will select different takes for different prints of the film. So it's when you're dealing with restoring a silent film in this way, it's, it's just, you have so many balls in the air that it's, I, I mean, I don't know how the editors stay sane, to be honest, um, because um, there are all these tiny little details that they are constantly watching to make sure that everything matches and looks correct. And then the other thing we have to question is the tinting scheme. Um, Tolable David was uh, tinted in certain, you know, uh, different scenes. And so sometimes they have actual written notes of what, what scenes were tinted, what color, and other times they have to go by what survives. Sometimes only a black and white copy survives, so they have to guess from that. Sometimes the European print has a different tinting scheme than the American print, and they have to figure out which one they're going with. So it's so much work, and I have so much respect for anyone who takes it on because it's it's a lot. <laughs> it is a lot. Let's let's spend a couple of minutes talking uh, about what Bruce brought up the ending and hearing other people's ideas, what they think the ending really means, and and then we can uh, we can hear from Fritzy about her ideas on the ending. So yeah, what got, what what are your what are your thoughts on the ending? Quite quite a quite a extensive back and forth in the chat. Um, okay, I was going to give some of the highlights about how yeah. some um, have think that it's the fact that he didn't deliver the mail like he was supposed to. He wasn't on time, and so. He didn't get that, um, he didn't feel like he accomplished this and he was still tolerable. While others said that, you know, the, the town thought he was a man for avenging his family, but that's not what he was all about. Um, and it's it's kind of interesting. I who said this, um, but then looked up Kinemon surname and the crest says, I shall stand. <clears throat> that's what David's last name means. So definitely he stood up for his family. Um, but um, Bruce brought up a question too that, you know, like what was this moment that would equate him as manhood? What was the transition? And it's, it's one of those questions that we're, we're kind of having to, to figure out here. So <clears throat> I'll open up the floor, raise your, raise yeah. your hands, and jump on in if you want to repeat what you said in the chat and we can do that too. Go ahead, Ethan. I really like the points that, that Wale made in the, um, in, in the chat, and I, I would I would like to popcorn over to him and, and let him express that verbally because I think I think that was very strong what he what he wrote. Yeah, definitely. Right, so, first, Wally, thanks. So I was saying, um, when we're kids, we can't wait to to grow up. We can't wait to drive our parents' cars. We romanticize being an adult, you know, and then when um, we gradually uh, like. Before I start, before I could drive, learn how to drive a car, I wanted to drive any car. I couldn't wait to drive a car, you know. And after a few, by the time I actually started driving a car, um, it became boring. It became a chore, you know. After a while, your parents start sending you on errands to, <laughs> you know. So that's one thing. Um, you have to grow out of childhood in order to stop romanticizing adulthood. So that was the first uh, point I made. The other point is um, there isn't any one event that makes you a man. Like, you, you, I don't believe adulthood is something that just happens because you pass a certain age or you do a certain thing, you know. Um, if a child, um, if, a, if a burglar comes into a house and the child has to shoot that burglar, that child doesn't become a man because they shot the burglar. You know, the child is still a child, you know, so th there isn't any event there that suddenly makes Dave, David an adult. He still has to wrestle with childish emotions, even though he has done um, a, a, a heroic thing. The good news is the community is going to treat him like a man. They're going to give him more respect and more responsibility. But 
is one thing to want that adulation and it's another thing to get to the point where you actually now have the responsibility to do that thing. Um, I think the last um, point I was, going to, I was trying to make was, um, uh, I, can't, I can't remember the last point, but yeah, the, he, oh yeah, the last point I was trying to make was the character growth, you know, in the last acts, everybody, in, you know, uh, screenwriting 101, in the last act, the character is supposed to have grown and made progress. So this character was a child. Um, when, 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 we don't know, when we don't know what we don't know, we think we know. This child now knows, okay, this is what everybody's been trying to tell me, that this thing isn't, isn't, isn't all it's been cut out to be. Um, now I know enough to know what I don't know. I understand that, okay, well, this adult thing thing isn't as glamorous as it is. And if you guys expect me to be doing this every day. <laughs> nah, nah, nah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's great. That's great. Yeah, that's a great uh, point, Holly, definitely. So uh, let's hear from Ethan, and then, and then I'd like to get uh, Fritzy's take on, on the ending. Yeah. Um, my interpretation of the ending that I was mentioning in, in the chat sort of um, stems from what I noticed about David throughout the movie, which is that one of his primary objectives, in fact, his primary objective for most of the movie is never about vengeance on the cousins. It's always about wanting to take over the mail delivery. He always somehow manages to find a way to get everything back to, I want to deliver the mail. So to him, that's, it's symbolic, maybe not so much in the movie, but to him, it's a symbolism of finally achieving manhood. And I, but of course, and I think I'm, I say something about this in the chat, there's a, an insert, a title at some point in the movie, right after the um, murder takes place, where someone in the town is whispering to the other person, like, if I were David, I would have mm -hmm. killed them by now or something like that. Mm -hmm. So the people in the town, they think that becoming a man or the manly thing to do mm -hmm. is to um, exact revenge on the people that messed up his family. They think that violence is that sign of manhood. So anyway, in the ending, from what I picked up, David goes to that house to get the mailbag back. He ends up um, killing the three bandits as he retrieves it. But instead of delivering the mail, obviously he's very badly wounded. He goes right back into town with all the undelivered mail. And when, they, when he gets there, Ma and everybody else praises him as a hero because he killed the criminals. He... Um, he the town. avenged, yeah. He avenged his family. He got out. He did what they thought was the manly thing to do. But David, what he thought the manly thing was to do was to deliver the mail. And he not only did not deliver the mail, but he probably still feels some kind of guilt over losing it in the first place. So I think, I personally, me think, can't speak for anybody else here. I think that's why he sees himself as just tolerable because he had this one objective throughout the movie of being a man and he fails at that, even though he succeeds at what everybody else thinks is, or at least should be his objective of being a man. Okay, and, and you know, is it possible that he achieved all of those objectives in the same act? Uh, Fritzi, let's hear, let's hear your take on the ending. Well, um... I think looking at the at the context of the period, I think most people in the audience would have probably at least hoped for a happy ending, even though they don't quite get it. Um, because like I said, they had just been through the war, they were ready for a little bit of, of happiness. Um, but interestingly, the original short story is, if anything, more ambiguous as to whether or not David survives. Um, I just wanted to uh, read off the the fi this final sentence, it says, a grim struggle began between his beaten flesh 
a terrible wariness and that spirit which seemed to be at once part of him and a voice. He wiped the blood from his young brow, from his eyes miraculously blue like an ineffable May sky. Just tolerable, David, he muttered weakly, only just tolerable. So Ooh. if if anything, it's it's more ambiguous as to whether or not um, David survives, but it's definitely like um, self-reproach almost, um, but he's also been very terribly beaten, so he's not entirely um you know comprehending yeah so i think um there's definitely room for the interpretation that maybe he never made it back to town in the original story or that he passed away when he returned oh um but i did want to bring out um regarding the hatfield and mccoy feud um and whether or not it was referenced in this i know buster keaton's film our hospitality from 1923 had characters called canfield and mckay and also the Hatfield McCoy feud was in the 1890s. It went up to the 1890s. So it would be like us, a movie nowadays referencing current events from 1990. So I think it's completely within the bounds of reason that it was a direct reference. Yeah, that's great. Uh, Fritzi, we're, we're, we're closing on, uh, on the last few minutes here, but I wanted to ask you quickly uh, because I was so taken with him. Can you tell us what this film did for the career of Richard Bartholomew. Well, he he became pretty much one of the top stars in Hollywood and was able to pick any role he wanted. And um, there's kind of a rumor that he was ruined by the talkies, but he was actually a major star until the mid thirties. Um, it's just that a lot of his films, later films haven't been terribly available and many still aren't, but he really did some wonderful films, particularly related to World War I veterans. He did Heroes for Sale, which was a talkie and touches on the Great Depression and, you know, the sort of the horrible situation that some veterans were in at the time. But um, I think my favorite film of his career outside of Tallable David is, is called The Enchanted Cottage. It was remade in 1945, but the 1924 original is just, it's an absolutely beautiful film. He goes to very dark places because he plays a a very wealthy young man who whose body was just completely destroyed by the war and so he's in pain um, he's bitter and he rents a cottage that used to be a honeymoon cottage and um, ends up falling in love with this woman who is equally bitter and they sort of find happiness together and it's just this really um, it's kind of almost a healing film in dealing with the the wounds of the war and how uh, you know kind of finding happiness where you can get it is important. And so I definitely recommend that. Yeah. We, we talked a little bit about uh, Raul Walsh, who, who started in the silent era and worked well into the, the sound era. But uh, let's, let's talk a little bit about Henry King. He, he's another director that um, did many films in the silent era, but also transitioned well into the, the sound era and did quite a few uh, many, many films. Um, tell us a little bit about where his career went from this point. Well, like um, Richard Barthamus, he basically, um, I mean, he had been directing since the mid 19 teens, but this set him up as like one of the top tier directors in Hollywood. And he pretty much stayed that stayed there until the, until mid century. And he, um, he, he directed some, some of the really, um, notable women's performances. For example, um, his Stella Dallas is an honest to God tearjerker. <laughs> and it just, it tears your heart out. And he directed uh, The White Sister, which is another tearjerker. And, but I mean, he was also versatile because he did, he did epics. He did, um, he did the um, non-musical version of State Fair, which is kind of returning to Americana. He was very versatile. So yeah, this movie pretty much put him at the top and kept him there. Song of Bernadette, I love that movie. <laughs> yeah, Song of Bernadette, yeah. yeah. Well, um, before we get to ask Fritzy for some recommendations, does anybody have any final thoughts or words on tonight's film? Oops, hold on a second. Just thought I want to watch more like it. Yeah. <laughs> Bob, Bob and, and Fritz. Fritz. Good guys don't die at the end of uh, Odyssey movies, period. <laughs> uh, 
it was the cliffhanger, Bob. That's what it is. <laughs> um, there are a couple of things. Again, when I when I watch silent movies, I, I look for how are they telling the story, how are they setting mood and emotion if they're not using you know uh, words or what have you. Um, two things that I thought were very emotive. One was um, when they brought Alan home and they put him in the bed and Rose is during the breastfeeding scene when she's rocking. At the beginning, she's rocking very quickly. And as they cut back to her in the bed and back to her, she's rocking more slowly each time. And I thought that was a very interesting directorial decision to just, I don't know if it was to calm things down or to bring things down that that I was almost expecting them to announce that Alan had died just because she's slowing down her rocking and that mood is coming down. Uh, the other thing that I, I noticed um, when David is outside of the dance and um, he, he's holding his hat and he starts doing a little dance shuffle and just the way he's holding his hat and the way he starts rocking his little dance shuffle, which is, it, it showed so much about what he was feeling that you, you really didn't need dialogue in there, you know, and, and a lot of the cards were not, maybe a third perhaps, were not dialogue cards, they were actually explaining what's going on, you know, undaunted our hero, uh, you know, marches back into the line of fire or what have you, but that I thought, those two scenes really stuck out. Um, and uh, again, someone mentioned earlier, the opening and closing of the door after the fight, not only does the door open slowly, but then it closes a little bit and it opens a little bit and close and then it opens and like, man, they're just dragging this out to that, to that, uh, fulfillment at the end. I thought, I thought those three cuts were just very well acted, very well directed. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Thank Bruce. That's, that's excellent. Well, uh, let's go ahead and uh, go to Fritzi and, and see if uh, you have any recommendations for us, anything, any other silent films that we might enjoy after watching Tolerable David. Well, um, one thing that you might enjoy as kind of a double feature is Wild Oranges, which is from 1924 and directed by King Vidor. And it's also based on a book by Joseph Hergesheimer. And it is very similar in the um, finding manhood um, through fighting a very large man um, in a violent manner. Um, it's basically tolerable David with adults by the seaside. And yeah, so I mean, if you wanted more of the same, there is more of the same. And I mean, it is derivative to a rather large degree, but it is also extremely well directed. And the fight scene is actually, um, it's bloodier. And um, I don't know if I would say it's, it's more intense because Tolable Day was a tough act to follow, but it's definitely worth seeing. And then if you wanted something that was kind of on the sweet and, you know, more idyllic kind of, uh, kind of viewing spectrum, what, what we kind of thought Tolable David might have been before it, it went on a darker side, I love The Wishing Ring from 1914, which is, um, it's just, so incredibly cute, but it uh, it manages to stay on the right side of cutesy. It never goes overboard to where, you know, it, it becomes saccharine. It's just kind of this adorable little short romance. Um, the cinematography is absolutely gorgeous. Um, Maurice Turner is the director, and it was uh, shot in Fort Lee, New Jersey. And it's... Um, the cast is so charismatic. Um, Vivian Martin is the leading lady and she's just a little bundle of joy. It's an absolutely delightful movie and definitely highly recommended. And of course, The Enchanted Cottage, if you want to see more of the Bartholomew's charm. Well, thank you. And, and I'm not sure if any of these movies are on Canopy, but uh, I'll take a look and see. Uh, maybe there's some we can get through Marina or we can find links to other, other places that might have those. Uh, and there are, and Fritzi and I have had this conversation through Twitter, there are, are so many wonderful silent films on Canopy that, that we haven't even mentioned. Uh, you could just do a search on silent film and, and so many great ones there to choose from. 
Well, Fritzy, we're, we're almost out of time, but uh, before we go, we would like to thank you so much for joining us tonight, not only to talk about Tolable David, but also to share your passion in silent for silent film. So thank you. Thank you so much. Um, and and Frissy, tell us where we can find you and your writing. Um, well, I, I do weekly silent film reviews on moviesilently.com. I'm going to be reviewing um, Castles for Two this Sunday, and we'll be talking about anti-Irish bias and riots that were caused by the movie. So it's very exciting. Wow. And um, then you can also find me making trouble on Twitter at Movie Silently. <laughs> you make the good kind of trouble that I enjoy. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you again, Fritzy, so much. And thank you, everyone, for joining us tonight. It's been a great discussion. And I hope to see you on April 16th for our discussion with Christina Lane. Sign up now. Don't wait because it may not be there all right well guess what i mean in the time that we've started and and to now we've got a we got double the people already so it's already wow. up to 15 so wow if you haven't so, signed up <laughs> yeah as soon as you log off sign up sign right up <laughs> all right so thanks everybody thank you darnese everybody take care be safe and watch some great movies all right good night everybody good night